got masks on. You just wait in for the magic words, go, go, go. It was thrilling. It captured the imagination of the world. It was a sort of James Bond moment. At one point, my wife got the children to turn the television off. She said, Dad's going to get himself killed. I don't want to see it. The big explosions go off. You could hear gunfire. A lot of screaming. A lot of shouting. First SAS men jumped back onto the balcony and stormed through the window. Flashbangs were going off. I think everyone was terribly proud. They thought, wow, look at these men in ski masks and trainers who suddenly leapt up on the building and rescued the people. It was mayhem with 19 hostages in there, still six terrorists. Death to the Shandabur. A mate of mine hit him on the back of the head with the MP5. I grabbed him, spun him round by his arm, and as I let him go, I shot him and he fell to the bottom of the stairs. After more than a decade as a soldier, Rusty Furman joined the elite of the British Army. I actually passed the SAS selection in 1977, and I had 15 years in the SAS with B Squadron, and that's how it all started for me. I wanted to be a policeman. I wanted the job of protecting the public and doing some good to help things go properly. And eventually I made sergeant and then progressed to inspector and ended up as a chief superintendent. The SAS is voluntary. So if you volunteer to go there, you can expect to live a life of discomfort. And trust me, that's exactly what I did, but I enjoyed it. I can remember being given some information saying that something was happening down in London. The teams had been called into camp. I was in my office as usual, and I received a call that there was an incident at the Iranian embassy in uh, Kensington and to uh, report to the senior CID officer there. No fast driving, no blue lights flashing. Get in there covertly and don't draw attention to yourself. And that's what we did. All I had to do was to sit down, get brought up to date with what's going on, told what they would like me to achieve, and then I was left to get on with it. All they knew was that a armed gang had forced their way into the embassy, taking prisoner the constable that was outside, and of course, making hostages of all those within. Trevor Locke, the constable who was inside. He was armed. We knew that, they didn't. So he was a constant worry. They used him to put pressure on us. Margaret Thatcher had made it absolutely clear and it came through to us that under no circumstances was she prepared to negotiate with hostage takers. They wanted people released in various Middle East countries. There is no way can the United Kingdom arrange that because it's a diplomatic effort and most of those countries are not gonna let people out of their prisons. But what they were trying to get was impossible. And our job was to keep them talking until we could talk them out. I'm not interested in the political part at the top at this stage because I'm part of a counter-terrorist team that's very well trained and organized. And all we wanted to do was find out what it was and what we were going to do on that operation. Under cover of darkness, Rusty and the other SAS members set up camp next door to the Iranian embassy in London, with just a wall between them. We have to be close by in case an incident occurs where we may have to go in and rescue the hostages. We had a field telephone, which was primitive, but you can't hack a field telephone. It has two ends with two bits of machinery there, which you speak into, and that's it. The media gathered to see the drama unfold. Death to the Shah Death to the Shah As Iranian protesters made their voices heard. As that group all seemed to be, and this is the Iranians. The story had broken, they were in there, so the world press had turned up and the television cameras 
all the agencies were there, all the, all, all the particular papers had their people there. The media we were aware of, their attention, and we had cameras in places that they didn't, so we could see a lot more than the public could see. They were put in their place at either side of Kensington Road where they could see the front of the building. The terrorists wanted independence and complete autonomy from the rest of Iran for the oil-rich province of Khuzestan. They were led by Wan Ali Mohammed, known as Salim, with his second-in-command, Shakir Abdullah Radhil, known as Faisal. Make a mistake, somebody could die. Say the wrong thing, somebody could die. So the concentration of the negotiator is enormous. All our hostage training is all to do with what if something happens, what if this happens? You can't cover them all. People talk about rapport. I don't like that word. I wasn't seeking a rapport with the person. That type of individual I detest because of what he's doing. What I want is control and communication. Police photographers were positioned around the embassy and were ready to photograph the terrorists on site should they show themselves. They were clearly photographing as much as they possibly can through the windows. But it was one of the various acts to try and identify them from the word go. And it suddenly came up that delivering something to the embassy would get somebody very close to the window. And if we uh, handed the thing over to them awkwardly, they might have to grab it, which would give us lovely sets of prints. And the boss said, well, who will take it? And I said I would take it. Max took a carton of cigarettes and started out towards the embassy. To an extent, I was frightened, but it had to be done. Not a very good move when you think about it, because um, there are three things that could happen. One, I'd be shot. Two, I might be taken hostage myself. Three, they wouldn't do anything. But the chances are that we would get something from it, and I was prepared to risk it. It is a risk, a, a big risk. He, he wasn't armed, he didn't have bulletproof vests on. He was just out in civilian clothes with a, a, a tie on, doing his job. Any one of them, if things weren't going well, could have had a go at Max out there. Looking down the barrel of Faisal's submachine gun with his finger on the trigger uh, is not a very pleasant sight. It was an emotional pressure, a psychological pressure. The only thing I forgot was the pressures on my family. Police and British government officials had kept an almost constant telephone link with the Iranians. At one point, my dead. wife got the children to turn the television off. She said, if Dad's going to get himself killed, I don't want to see it. After three days of negotiating with terrorists at the Iranian embassy in London, police negotiator Max Vernon was doing everything he could to prevent them killing the hostages. Looking down the barrel of Faisal's submachine gun with his finger on the trigger, uh, it's not a very pleasant sight. When I got back <laughs> and realised, really, that the risk that I'd taken, they didn't want to shoot me because I wasn't causing any problems, and they don't know what would happen if they had. Yes, that was contentious, but it worked. By day four, we're ticking over, but we're not actually getting anywhere. We're just extending the uh, siege and hopefully wearing them out. As 12 noon came and went, it was clear that the Iranians inside the London Embassy were not fueled with sufficient fanaticism to carry out their ultimate threat. And they were still talking, as in the distance, Big Ben struck 12. The talking went on. On the fifth day, for the very first time, Salim actually wanted to discuss surrendering. How it could be done, how it would be organised, we agreed to think about it overnight and take it up the following day. It was just another day of the operation to start with. Everything was going the same uh, as we'd been doing day in and day out until sometime 
around about midday thereafter, where things got a bit more tense with more information, more intelligence. As the SAS waited, they had no knowledge of the power struggle going on inside between the terrorists and the hostage Abbas Lavasani, the Iranian embassy's chief press officer. Lavasani, who was a Iranian diplomat who had been insulting the hostage takers all the time. He was determined to be a martyr. They got totally fed up with him and Faisal shot him. You get the message and you get into position. You've got all your assault kit with you and you're just waiting for the magic words, go, go, go. And we had a dead person. And I said, this is a different ball game, Salim. You've gone over the line. And his voice was very sad and low. He said, yes, I know. They changed it by executing him and throwing him outside. I got a silly child's voice in my head singing, I know you're going to die. And I sat there, I thought, what the hell's going on? And I managed to shut it off and cast it on one side. Couldn't forget it, but it didn't happen again. Once they dump the body of Lavasani outside on the steps, they pick him up, confirm he's dead, and take him away. That's proof of murder on UK soil. And it was handed over to the SAS. It was now our control. I watched them from our monitors in our room, up on the roof, gathering. At that point, I became redundant. The army had taken over, and they were dealing with it. We had to go covertly into position. We didn't want to be compromised. My team's at the back, red team at the top of the building, up sailors coming down the building. A foot went through a window and alerted the terrorist. That initiated, really, the go, go, go. As millions were glued to the final of the World Snooker Championship, the BBC cut live to the Iranian embassy siege, and viewers would witness, for the first time ever, the SAS in action. Suddenly, the, the attack began, so everyone had a grandstand view. It was a sort of James Bond moment. They've got masks on. We then entered the building. Our job was to go in through the library at the back. We start clearing the rooms on the bottom floor. Flashbangs were going off. First SAS men jumped back onto the balcony and stormed through the window. You could hear gunfire. A lot of screaming. A lot of shouting. People crying. Me down on the ground floor with my team, smoke in the air, gas in the air. I know that Trevor Locke tried to uh, disarm Sally and wasn't successful, and one of the SAS guys fired first, and that was the end of Salim. It was mayhem with 19 hostages in there, still six terrorists, and, of course, our team. Next BBC man, Sim Harris, is brought up by a hooded SAS man. He crouches on the balcony. There was some shouting and pointing from the first floor. They were trying to point out what appeared to be a terrorist. Somewhere in amongst that was Faisal. A mate of mine hit him on the back of the head with the MP5, grabbed him, spun him round by his arm, and as I let him go, I shot him and he fell to the bottom of the stairs. I went down, saw the grenade, picked the grenade up and put it in my ops waistcoat pocket. The pin was still in. At the rear of the building, more marksmen have the embassy covered. Then everybody went their own way, carrying on the operation until we got everybody out of the building. sat in the corner in one of those easy chairs and I cried. I didn't know why. I wasn't sad. I wasn't feeling sorry for them. I began to wonder what, what, what in effect was happening to me. The boss came in. He said, you've got exactly one minute to phone your wife to let her know you're in one bit. Then get the hell out of here because the place is on fire. The next thing I remember, I'm at home. I have no memory of that journey whatsoever. On the 5th of May, 1980, the lenses of the world's media captured the SAS in action, and global recognition soon followed. We saw the film of them doing it. 
but there's something about a frozen image that you can read like a report and that certainly captured the attention and, and uh, admiration not only of the citizens of this country pretty much the citizens of the whole world you have a an appreciation and a sharpness if you're any use of what sells newspapers and what the public want to see i think everyone was terribly proud they thought wow Look at these, we didn't know we had these men in ski masks and sort of trainers who suddenly leapt up on the building and, 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 and rescued the people. It was thrilling. The photos of the SAS storming the embassy and rescuing the hostages propelled them to superhero status around the globe. We knew that we had to do a job. The job was to rescue the hostages. That's the mission. So. That's what we did. You're not looking for a pat on the back. You're not looking... You've just done what you were supposed to do. If you're going to have heroes, you, they're pretty good heroes to have. Impressive, modest, they, they've no side at all. Certainly admirable. And it wasn't only the heroism of the SAS that was in evidence. I kept most of the hostages alive through negotiation but I hadn't negotiated a peaceful ending, which was beyond my control because Faisal lost his temper and killed the Iranian diplomat. And it wasn't until later that I realized that I kept all those hostages alive for five to six days. Through all the pressures, I gave the SAS six days time to plan to give them the best possible chance of ending it with little or no injury to themselves. He did a great job, and I've told him that. And um, I'm sure most people would say that if we'd gone in on day one, it would have been probably very bloody. After the grim tension of the previous six days, there was a weird vacuum of inactivity as London's police quietly and for the most part secretly followed up the events of the siege end. And still no details of those frightening final moments inside the embassy. We sat there and waited for a, a bit of a debrief and the arrival of the Prime Minister. We didn't actually get to watch the snooker anymore because you wouldn't believe that what came on the TV when Mr Thatcher came in was the front of the embassy. The eyes of the world were on this. As that was happening, they were stood in the way. Of course, John, my mate, he just shouted, can you get out the effing way? And of course, they generally did move out the way. It was a, a nice touch for that night. And um, we watched the, the little news clip that came on of what happened, not expecting ever to have seen that. The world gets its first full glimpse of the fairy tale princess, demure behind her veil. It was a pretty important day. It was great fun as well. It was a jubilee this moment. Way. Hi, Diana Francis. Take thee, Charles. Philippe. Then we all began to chant, kiss her, kiss her. Charles was slightly hesitant in himself, whereas Diana was straight in and, and, and had the kiss. There was a sigh of, thank Christ, we've got it now at last. And that was the page one picture all around the world. All the best fairy stories end with the words, and they all lived happily ever after. Well, you know, fairy tales, sadly, all come to an end. My parents bought me a Kodak box brownie camera, and it just fascinated me. When I left school, I served an apprenticeship, and eventually I got my job on the Daily Mirror as a result of covering a royal tour. The British monarch is greeted by the Lion of Judah, Emperor Haile Selassie, on this royal occasion. So when I got back, I went to see the picture editor and I got the staff job on the Mirror. As the royal family pose on the steps of St Paul's, the burning question in every loyal heart is, when will the prince marry? One morning, the editor called me in and said, there's a rumor that um, Prince Charles is dating Lady Diana Spencer, who lives down in Chelsea. I thought it was below my pay grade at that stage to go doorstepping. It was headline news. Diana, as a 19-year-old, was suddenly thrust into this media uh, limelight. And prior to that, as a, an aristocratic lady herself from the Spencer dynasty, 
you know, was a school teacher. People mocked her. They said she was a girl, I think she had one O level, and they considered her to be sort of beautiful and pretty and empty headed. I can remember her coming out of that flat and just looking up with her head down in the morning. There was such a great deal of interest in Fleet Street in this beautiful young girl who could possibly become the next Queen of England. Rumours were rife, but the Prince kept the nation guessing. She slimmed down so she photographed better. She liked being photographed. She wore clothes very well and she responded. The fact that Prince Charles was dating her naturally created a great deal of interest in the tabloids, especially in Fleet Street. I was invited, and I was editing to Kensington Palace by Prince Charles to talk about her relationship with the press, essentially. I think Prince Charles wanted to educate her. I remember saying to her, well, at the moment, you are the most glamorous couple in the whole world. For a time, Taylor and Burton were the most glamorous couple in the world. You put their picture on the front page and the world bought papers. Wow, she said, oh, so you think I'm like Liz Taylor, do you? Then, on the 24th of February, 1981, from Buckingham Palace came the news that the whole world had been waiting for. The announcement of the engagement was on, it did create even more interest. And then you start thinking, this girl is going to be Queen of England one day. The heir to the throne presented his beautiful bride-to-be. The happy couple posed for the press photographers in the palace gardens. What national newspapers did is they appointed a royal correspondent and a royal photographer to cover the royal family. And when I say the royal family, I'm on about Diana. The marriage service is planned for St Paul's Cathedral when Her Majesty's subjects everywhere will join in wishing Lady Diana and the Prince of Wales every happiness in the years ahead. We covered everything she did every day on her diary, whether she was going to meetings, crossing pavements. The engagement of the heir to the throne to Lady Diana Spencer ended years of speculation. Every day of her life was being played out in the national and international media, and that isn't much fun. So far, the royal wedding industry is said to be worth over 500 million pounds. The wedding was to take place on the 29th of July, 1981, and was expected to be watched by almost a billion people. The glory of London City, St Paul's Cathedral, masterpiece of England's greatest architect, Sir Christopher Wren. Six, seven weeks prior to the actual wedding, there were meetings to look at the route and decide where the positions would be best for, for the pictures. They're the obvious positions, the balcony shot of Buckingham Palace, and then the carriage shots all the way from St Paul's, and there were stands that were built, especially for photographers and TV cameras that would be in position for that. As if by royal appointment, the weather on the great day is perfect, giving London a touch of summer magic. It was a pretty important and interesting day. It was great fun as well. It was a jubilee moment, happiness, a great occasion. The enchanting bridesmaids with wreaths of flowers in their hair and the page boys, straight and slim, in 19th century sailor suits. It was happening just down the road from Fleet Street. It happened to be the day that I was doing the paper personally. Though still a commoner, the pretty English girl would be transformed into the third lady of the realm, Princess of Wales. I was actually laying out the pages myself and choosing the pictures with my old friend Paddy O'Gara. The world gets its first full glimpse of the fairy tale princess, demure behind her veil, and the wedding dress that has been a carefully guarded secret. I, Diana Francis. I, Diana Francis. Take thee, Charles Philip Arthur George. Take thee. I was the chief photographer and raw photographer of the Daily Mirror, and I had choice of where I wanted to go. But I wanted to be in St Paul's, photographing Diana, and also with Charles, and also with the Queen being there. With this ring, I thee wed. I thee wed. To me, that was the position I thought would be best. I pronounce that they be man and wife together. Their Royal Highnesses, the Prince and Princess of Wales, make their way back down the aisle to the tumultuous welcome awaiting them at the steps of St Paul's. We were in the office and the pictures were coming in by the cart load and we were shifting through them to decide where we would put the pictures. And so, out into sunshine and bells and wild delight, 
as a palpable wave of affection and pride wells out from the crowd. And there they were, on the television in my office, on the balcony. So great activity, and uh, I think we'd even opened a bottle of wine or two, and we were enjoying ourselves doing this particular job. Uh, but then we all began to chant, kiss her, kiss her. If you look at the TV coverage on that uh, instant, and you listen to the kiss, 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 Charles was slightly hesitant in himself, whereas Diana was straight in and, and, and had the kiss. It was the image for the wedding. There was a sigh of, thank Christ, we've got it now at last. And that was the picture. There's Diana looking, generally enjoying that moment. This was something that, you know, she wanted, had agreed to it, was in love with the Prince of Wales and that the Prince of Wales was rather royal, rather standoffish. Oh, this is not something I really thought we might be doing. It wasn't scheduled. It's never been done there before. And it was a split second. And if 10 got that, that split second, there was variations of the before the kiss and the actual kiss, and that was over. And that was the page one picture on every national newspaper and, of course, all around the world. It is a, a classic royal photograph. The first of its kind, royals before that didn't do that sort of thing on the balcony at Buckingham Palace. It was, oh, we don't do that. All the best fairy stories end with the words, and they all lived happily ever after. May we pray that this fairy story is no exception. Well, you know, fairy tales, sadly, all come to an end. The iconic photo captured people's hearts all around the globe. As Princess Diana began her royal duties, the public were keen to see her up close. If you look at the very first major tour that they ever did together in Australia, the media wanted her, they didn't want him. He said, oh, well, the next time I come, I'll, I'll bring two princesses. You know, one can walk either side of the road and I'll walk down the middle. A joke, it, but he meant it. He realizes the focus is on Diana and not on him. The way in which she conducted herself was so different from other members of the royal family. That's what gave her her popularity. She was one of the first royals to have this ability to communicate with anyone across the sort of social spectrum. On the 21st of June, 1982, Prince William was born. And life seemed settled for the royal couple. On the 15th of September, 1984, they were joined by Prince Harry. But as the boys grew, so did the rumours of affairs on both sides. Nobody could really understand how bad this marriage was going, and then, of course, there was Camilla in the background all the time. Diana, at that particular time, was having an affair with James Hewitt. The Prince of Wales had been having an affair with, with Camilla Parker Bowles. There was a lot of confiding about her relationship. My first ever engagement with, with Diana, with her two children and the Prince of Wales, was in Mallorca. And uh, this was almost an annual holiday at that particular time, where the, where the Prince and the Princess of Wales would go on holiday with the King of Spain in their, their palace. The Prince had gone off with the King of Spain. I got a phone call from her saying, oh, Ken, can you come and see me? I said, yeah, OK. So I ran up to the Maravent Palace. And then quite an extraordinary thing happened because she said, the reason I called you up is I just want to put you in the picture and let you know more about me because it's going to make your life more interesting and, and perhaps easier if you know exactly where I'm at. And then she unfolded her life way back before she met the Prince of Wales and the existence of Camilla and uh, that Camilla existed even before she agreed to marry him, but believed that the Prince of Wales entitled to his mistresses would, would jettison Camilla and live happily ever after with his princess. Unfortunately, the story didn't quite unfold like that. Both Diana and the Prince of Wales did everything they could to put on this sort of public show of, of happiness for the benefit of their two young sons, William and Harry. The media had a lot more of what was going on than the public did at that time. We knew there were problems afoot with the marriage. In any normal relationship, this sort of marriage would have folded years before and would have gone unnoticed in the real world. The sad thing is, of course, this was a prince and a princess, and the world wanted to know about it. 
another iconic picture of Diana is her sitting alone outside the Taj Mahal. That picture summed up everything. The Taj is one of the most wonderful buildings built for romance by this man that loved this woman. We thought this would be you know, a great picture, but it was so sad to see her sitting there on her own. About 10 years earlier, I was on a world trip with Prince Charles and we sat him on that same bench. And he said, you know, one day, Mr. Gavin, I'm gonna bring my wife back here. This is such a beautiful moment. It never happened because on that day when she posed for that picture, he decided to stay on another meeting. In 1992, Prime Minister John Major formally announced the separation of Princess Diana and Prince Charles. I had so many conversations with Diana um, prior to the, um, the divorce, and it, it was a sad story. The whole world was with Diana. I mean, this, this was it. You know, she was the Queen of Arts. It was her phrase, and, and it, it, she was. She also knew how to respond to a photograph and to bat her eyes at photographers. I mean, half the press photographers thought she, they, she was in love with them. She was in love with their lenses, that's what it was. Throughout the 80s and 90s, I don't think there was a, a red-top newspaper that didn't have a picture of Diana or a story somewhere. And most of that was supportive and very pro-Diana because she was a beacon of news. There's been many stories run about that we used Diana for, for our own purpose, but she manipulated the media in her own way as well. I mean, she called upon certain things and leaked things to be done to get the coverage that she needed. Happy birthday. Happy to hear you. When I left in October of 93, two weeks later, I went back to Kensington Palace at her request. She said, look, what is the best piece of advice you could give me? I said, there's only one piece of advice now I can give you. Whatever you do is please do not give up your Scotland Yard security. After the wedding of the 80s, a certain kiss became one of the most iconic royal photos of all time. And that was the page one picture on every national newspaper and of course all around the world. But the fairy tale didn't last. In any normal relationship, this sort of marriage would have folded years before and we've gone unnoticed in the real world. The sad thing is, of course, this was a prince and a princess and the world wanted to know about it. There were many times that we had chats. On one occasion, coming back from Pakistan, we were in the galley. She was talking about the troubles of the, the, the you know, the marriage and the things and she said, you know, in a way, I still love him and it's, and, and sort of didn't didn't well up, but she was deeply upset about the, the way things had turned out. One was in love, one wasn't. Unfortunately, you know, despite Diana's love for the Prince of Wales, it was never going to work because he never loved her and he loved Camilla Parker Bowles. That's the upshot of it. And on the 28th of August, 1996, the Prince and Princess of Wales were officially divorced and went their separate ways. For my part, you know, I, I firmly believe that she did genuinely love the Prince of Wales. Sadly, this wasn't something that was reciprocated. To satisfy the public's ever-increasing fascination with Princess Diana, the paparazzi constantly fed the newspapers anything they could. Diana knew the difference between the freelance paparazzis, if you like, and the royal photographers. The paparazzi followed around uh, constantly were simply looking for a photograph that they could sell to the world. She said to me on, on one occasion, two photographers followed her, so she just decided to get into a cab to get away from them. And the cab got caught with the lights, and they undid the door, and she's crying in the well of the taxi. I like to think that British press photographers do their job, and they have a difficult job to do, um, but they have a different set of standards to people who are just trying to snatch a picture under any circumstances. With security, that wouldn't happen because they only got there because there was no one to tell them you can't go there. Those pictures were never ever used in the English media. Sadly, they got out into the foreign press. In July 1997, Diana started dating Dodie Fired. We were very excited when we saw the photographs. We knew we had to have them. That's what journalists want. And holidayed with him in the Mediterranean later that summer. On the 30th of August, they arrived at the Ritz Hotel in Paris.
I had a call at um, about midnight, but I was told that um, there'd been a crash in Paris and that uh, Dodie had died and Diana was severely injured. I had a pager and it said, ring me urgent, it was my boss in London. And then Piers Morgan rang me, who was then editor of the Daily Mirror, and said, would you get into the office as quick as you can? By the time I'd left my home in Essex, at the time I got to the Daily Mirror building, I was told that she died. And I said, that's not possible. She, she couldn't die in, in, in a car accident. It's impossible. Um, she has. The story broke. It was just a terrible tragedy. And had the poor girl been wearing a seatbelt, she would have been okay. It's a, a perfect tragedy. Then when we got nearer, you could see a terrible, terrible accident that had happened. My God, it's a woman. Very slumped photographers, like, all over. There are two distinct divisions of the media. You've got the, the freelancers, the paparazzi, the guys on their own. How close were the photographers? Right up to the window. Right on top of the car. And, and the Fleet Street people, and the Fleet Street guys, from my experience, knew where the boundaries were. <laughs> The paparazzi were, were, the, were the problem. Both British and French police blamed the accident on driver Henri Paul, who also died. They say he was driving drunk and speeding when he crashed in that Paris tunnel. Investigators also claimed that a group of chasing paparazzi had contributed to the fatal crash. What happened was one of their great sources of income ended. They didn't hunt her to her death. I mean, they didn't want to try and kill her. They, they would have liked her to live to be an old lady taking photographs of her, snatching photographs of her topless at Saint-Tropez from some rich man's yacht. Their refusal to take pictures was a protest against the criminal investigation of nine colleagues in connection with the death of Princess Diana. You, press that killed her. These paparazzi are vulgar, violent, disgusting. When she abandoned her security with us in in 93, 94. She inherits the protection of Mohammed al Fayed in 97 and has the protection of Dodi Fayed for seven weeks, at the end of which she's dead. I don't stand up for people who create the news. Unfortunately, there's a portion of all of us to blame. I'm sorry. I blame the Sun newspaper and the ill. Criticism was leveled at the media and even a possible cause of her death. The Princess of Wales is dead. I wonder how you sleep at night. Now, all this could have been avoided had they'd had this contact and negotiation and reasoning with the media that could have actually helped them rather than, you know, be a negative force. The death of Diana stunned Britain. Utterly devastated. And shocked the world. She had great love for the poor. This is a very difficult time for millions of people in the United Kingdom who are deeply shocked and grieving. It was almost a farewell to the stiff upper lip. The emotion that was expressed, the sea of flowers. Some of the older ones, including I think the royal family, wanted to carry on in this sort of old fashioned tradition of, of not letting the emotions show. And other people wore their heart on their sleeve. And it, it showed a, a very great division what had happened to this country. The outpouring of grief was something that Britain had never experienced before. When the coffin came off of that, uh, of that flight, draped with the, you know, royal, the, the royal flag, I, I had a lump in my throat and tears in my eyes, I was sort of welling up. I couldn't believe I had, you know, had to take the pictures, but I couldn't believe that actually this was Diana and the way that all of this, those 18 years of being with her, it ended up like this. And then you had this, this quite surreal uh, point when William and Harry, the Prince of Wales, her brother, the Duke of Edinburgh, you know, walked behind her coffin. This is a sense of duty. This is what royals do. And this had to be that. This was a, a funeral of somebody that had changed the face of royalty in the 
the 20th century. As you may recognize now, it's, it's my mother's engagement ring. So of course it's very special to me. It was my way of making sure that my mother didn't miss out on uh, today and the excitement and the, uh, the fact that we're gonna spend the rest of our lives together. One of the great quotes of William said when he got engaged to Kate, is I'm not gonna let happen to Kate what happened to my mother. There's a very, very difficult line about what to cover and not to cover. I get you both to look into the camera here for me. And sometimes the papers step over the line and they get slapped back. The powers to be, and William and Harry especially, made sure that the wheels were set in motion, that the letters were sent to editors of Fleet Street and around the world to not to do with this, that and the other, and they would be taken to the courts if they did. So, yeah, it, it changed. That beautiful young lady, it was like Cinderella. <laughs>